शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतेर द्योशांतेर दिशा शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशांते वायु शांतिरादित्यशांतेश चंद्रमा शांतेर नक्षत्राणि शांतिराप शांतिरोषदयशांतेर वनस्पतयशांतेर गोशांतिरजाशांतिरश्वशांतिर पुरुषशांतेर ब्रह्मशांतेर ब्राह्मणशांतेर शांतिरेवशांतेर शांतेर में अस्तु शांति ही में दे भी पीस ऑन एर्थ एंड इन द स्काई में दे भी पीस इन द वाटर एंड इन ऑल डायरेक्शंस में दे भी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarve trasukhina santu, sarve santu niramaya ha, sarve bhadrani pasyantu, ma kaschit dukha bhag bhavet, sarvas taratu durgani. सर्वो भद्राणि पश्यतु सर्वसद्बुद्धिमापनोतु सर्वसर्वत्र नंदतु मैं ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मैं ऑल सी व्हाट इस गुड एंड मैं नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरिंग मैं ऑल ओवरकम देर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मैं पीपल एवरीवेर फाइंड जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore Practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time 
dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om
ಓಂ ಅಸತೋಮ ಸತ್ಕಮಯ ತಮಸೋಮ ಜ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ಮ ಅಮೃತ ಗಮಯ ಆವಿರಾವೀರ್ಮಯೇಧಿ ರುದ್ರಯತ್ತೆ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಮುಖಂ ತೇನ ಮಾಂ ಪಾಹಿ ನಿತ್ಯ ಮೇ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಲೀಡರ್ಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಟು ಲೈಟ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಡೆತ್ ಟು ಎ ಮೋರ್ಟಾಲಿಟಿ ಮೇ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಫಿಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಹಾರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ today our subject is swami brahmananda his life and uh, message swami brahmananda was a, a disciple of ramakrishna a brother disciple of vivekananda he was the first head of the the ramakrishna order sri ramakrishna had identified him as one of the the companions of krishna in an earlier incarnation which is why we had the song on krishna in the beginning swami brahmananda was born just 9 days after vivekananda in the year 1863 21st january was and so he was 9 days younger to vivekananda they were very close friends they knew each other Uh, even before they came to to ramakrishna his pre monastic name was uh, rakhal chandra ghosh he was married in his teens uh, to uh, a girl from a family of devotees and so that's how through his uh, wife's family connection that he came to know about ramakrishna a few days before he first came to ramakrishna sri ramakrishna had a, a, a mystical vision in which the divine mother appeared before him and uh, handed him a, a, a baby and said this is your son and then a few days later when this rakhal he was probably in his uh, late teens might have been 18 or 19 years old then um when he first came to dakshineshwar uh, ramakrishna was immediately able to identify that that was the child that he had seen in mystical vision and so all through his life he looked upon him as as uh, his own spiritual son from a very young age as we see in the life of many other disciples of ramakrishna he he had a a very natural longing towards spiritual life after he started coming to dakshineshwar for a while then sri ramakrishna requested that he stay there and uh, attend on him and he that's exactly the kind of opportunity this rakhal was looking forward to after staying for some time with ramakrishna in 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 the temple garden we found we find in his life that his spiritual life deepened to such an extent that he began to experience deep samadhis and a point was reached when sri ramakrishna remarked that rakhal was is staying here to take care of me but at times he is so absorbed in in god that i have to take care of him and actually sri ram krishna enjoyed doing that because he saw him just as a mother would take care of her little child ram krishna would would take care of uh, rakha when he was in that uh, deep deep uh, state so after sri ram krishna's passing when these disciples of ram krishna gathered together and had a formal vows of monasticism um he was given the name swami brahmananda um he had such deep understanding of human nature that um that he was a natural leader 
So Vivekananda, he's, even at the time when Ramakrishna was living, he once said, we will call you by the name Raja, really meaning a king, because you, you know exactly how to, because of your leadership qualities, you know how to do the right thing at the right time and say the right thing at the right time. And when he told uh, Ramakrishna late, later that we have all decided to address him as Raja, um, Sri Ramakrishna was very happy. And therefore, in the order, uh, Ramakrishna order, um, Swami Brahmananda is more um, popularly known as Raja, Raja Maharaj, or simply Maharaj. He remained head of the order from 1998 to 1922. And during his long tenure as leadership of the order, the order really, the, the basic foundation of the order was laid for work, not only in India and in Asian countries, but also in the West. Swami Vivekananda once made a, a very remarkable statement, and that was that each of these first generation of Ramakrishna's disciples, they, they were so great in their spiritual life that had they come at different points in history, each were capable of starting an entire different religious movement in his name. But they all came together as, as, as disciples of Ramakrishna. And so, while Swami Vivekananda is, is a better known name with, with lots of books and so on. Um, many other direct disciples of Ramakrishna who remain in the background, and that's exactly how, how they wanted it to be. For that matter, Vivekananda didn't choose to come in the foreground himself. We read uh, when he first came here and became a, almost a celebrity overnight in Chicago at the Parliament of Religions. Uh, next day, his name was emblazoned in the headlines of all the papers. In his life, we read that that night he couldn't sleep. He just wept in the room in Chicago because he knew that, he's, that that was the end of my life as an unknown monk. So, so uh, while name and fame has its own um, attraction and glory, uh, those people who have had it oftentimes find that it's a big sacrifice that they have to make. So Swami Brahmananda was such a deep dynam dynamo of spirituality that um, Swami Vivekananda once remarked that Brahmananda is even more spiritual than I am. We are lucky that his teachings, although he wrote no books, hardly gave any lectures at all, um, we have a, a considerable literature about uh, reminiscences of his, written by his disciples and other swamis and dis devotees who came in contact with him. Um, and so we do know, we have opportunities to know about some of the prominent teachings that he gave. Um, I just brought with me two of his books. Um, one is a fairly old book, it's called The Eternal Companion. Some of you may be familiar uh, with this book. These are the the diary notes and the conversations that Brahmananda had with his, uh, with the younger monastics in Belurmat and other centers of the order and also with devotees. Uh, what is remarkable about this book, uh, we often have had this um, debate um, at several points about the title, The Eternal Companion. So who is this title referring to? And really, there is no one clear answer to it. One answer is, of course, as I said in the beginning, uh, Ramakrishna identified him as a companion of Krishna. So the eternal companion could be Rakhal as a companion of Krishna. Uh, but also, as a companion of Ramakrishna, because he came along with Ramakrishna to teach and spread the teachings and insights that Ramakrishna gave. And to us personally, those of us who have come later and have access to Ramakrishna's life and teachings only through books, the book itself becomes our own 
eternal companion. Because for spiritual seekers, this book has deals with questions and doubts that we all have. Sometimes when we read the, the, the lectures that Vivekananda gave, they deal with principles, often dealing with very abstract topics. And what that requires is to transform those principles into liver, um, practicable techniques in our own daily life of relating those principles to our own spiritual life. Um, what this book does is actually make those principles, those teachings very concrete. So I'll, I will a little later read out one or two samples from it to see, to show you how practical this book is. The other book that we have about Swami Brahmananda, it's called Swami Brahmananda as we saw him. And this has the reminiscences and memories about Brahmananda, written by his own brother disciples and also by Swami's, his own disciples as well. Swami Akhilananda, who was the, the second head of the Boston Center from 1941 through 1962, was a disciple of Swami Brahmananda. Uh, many of the second generation Swamis of the order who came to the United States and other Western countries were disciples of Swami Brahmananda. So his legacy, even in a more direct way, continues to nourish the Vedanta movement in this country. So let me read to you some, just to give you a sample of how helpful these books can be. So this is what uh, Brahmananda as a spiritual teacher, the section on Brahmananda as a teacher. Let me read to you a little bit from it. The Swami exercised the greatest discrimination in imparting spiritual teachings. As a rule, he avoided the lazy and the inquisitive who wished to attain spiritual experience without striving for it. What is the use, he said, of tiring myself for nothing in speaking of spiritual practice to people who won't follow them? I speak of higher matters only to a very few who, think, who I think would take my word and act upon it. He was ever ready to help the struggling soul and the sincere seeker of the truth and undergo all forms of troubles for their sake. And many of us know from what we experienced in our own lives as well as in those of others. Uh, this was especially in context um, when, when several devotees would gather around him and rather than speak about spiritual matters, uh, he would be just telling them funny stories. And then someone said, you are a spiritual teacher. Why do you just tell just stories and jokes? And then, and then it's in that context he said something similar. He said that uh, a lot of people, they're so tired with worries and anxieties and exhaustion while working. And so when they come to the monastery uh, for some peace and quiet, uh, that's all that most people really seeking. So to such people, I just, I just to kind of relax them body and mind, I tell them stories. But when I find a sincere seeker, uh, to them then he would give um, what we might say as spiritual teachings. But what should be kept in mind here is that when these great souls, even if they tell stories and jokes which might apparently not seem serious enough to be qualified as a spiritual teaching, they are teaching us nonetheless. In fact, the best teaching is given when we don't even know that we are being taught. Um, there is this, this one, one story uh, which I like very much and which probably many of you know. There were these two brothers, very, very young. One was a probably four-year-old, the other was six or seven. And um, they, they loved to play and they, wouldn't, they didn't want to study all that much. So their parents then um, engaged a tutor who will come every, uh, every day at home and then see that they get their homework done and learn their lessons. And of course, the boys just didn't like it. They, so they come back from school, they're tired, they want to go out and play, and here is this tutor waiting for them to give lessons. And, and so one day then this tutor said, well, let me try to make it interesting for them. So 
And so what he did, instead of teaching them math like two plus two equals four, what he did was he brought several apples with him. And then he just put two apples on the table and said, well, how many apples these are? And then the older brother says, one, two. Uh, then he put two more apples and he said, now how many there are? And then he counted one, two, three, four. The younger one is smarter. He's looking very suspiciously at it. <laughs> and as the older one was about to tell the answer, counting the apples, the younger one says, brother, don't tell, don't tell. He's trying to teach us. <laughs> So sometimes there is a resistance to formal teaching, but unconsciously, through stories, through jokes, uh, when we don't even know. And we see that even in the Ramakrishna's life. A lot of times he'll be, and if you read the Gospel of Ramakrishna, there are so many stories, apparently funny stories, and you would see sometimes the disciples would be like rolling with laughter. But through these teachings, um, profound truths were given, and oftentimes, um, what's important is, of course, to remember the lesson, not just the story, what that story was meant to teach us. So that is what Swami Brahmananda did. Uh, to continue, Brahmananda had no consciousness of the teacher. <clears throat> At times he told the disciple, the mind is in such a state that I feel I could entreat you all one by one, even touching your feet, saying, do this, my son, do this, I implore you. But again, I think, who am I to instruct you in all this? The Lord is there, and as he makes us do, so it is done. Why should people take my words, even though they ask me? But then you know, my boy, when inspiration comes from within, then people do take them and follow them. Strive on, my son, strive on and on. He said on another occasion, if you desire to do work in the right spirit, you must hold these two great principles in view. In the first place, I think this is very important. In the first place, you must possess a profound regard for the work undertaken. And secondly, you must be quite indifferent to the fruits thereof. Then alone can you do work in the proper way. This is called the secret of karma yoga. And you can avert all disinclination for work if you only consider it as belonging to God. It is when you forget this secret that you become disturbed in mind. In a disturbed mind, you will not succeed either in advancing spiritually or in doing secular work. So I think, I think it's very helpful that do we love and respect the work that we have to do? And if we are able to do that work without as best we can, without seeking its results, because the results are going to come anyway. If you do it well, the results will come, whether you seek it or not. But if that itself doesn't become my main motivation, the results, then we'll be practicing karma yoga. And if we do the work that way, then our heart will be purified. Ramananda says, a karma yogi must welcome any work that may befall to his or her share and gradually adjust themselves to all requirements. Simply carrying on some work is not enough. It must be done in a detached way, in the holy name of God. A karma yogi must keep three-fourths of their mind in God, and with the remaining one-fourth, they should do whatever th there has to be done. Follow this rule, then alone can you do your work in the proper manner. Your mind too will become expanded, and you will feel great joy in your heart. Never forget God. To maintain this attitude, you must stick to your spiritual practice by all means. I do not know, he used to say, how far it is possible to serve others and the country before one's character is well formed. My belief is that the person who cannot solve their own problems will not be able to solve the problems of other people. And that's what sometimes I call this aggressive form of unselfishness. Aggressive form of service is not always helpful. That am I busying myself with other people's problems because I don't want to deal with my own? Or I'm able to swim and, they, and then I can go out and try to help others who want to learn swimming or who are about to drown. But if I can't swim myself, then I, I really won't be able to help others. 
The Swami always placed before his followers the ideal of an all-round growth, physical, intellectual, moral, and spiritual. He himself used to take regular physical exercise and also urged others to do so. He also encouraged them to develop their intellect through systematic studies, which increased the power of understanding and kept them away from idle gossip and other harmful habits. He was preeminently a spiritual teacher and his instructions differed with different people. To one becoming engrossed in work, he spoke of one-pointed spiritual practice for some time. To another who needed a life of balance, he said, fix your mind firmly on God and perform your worldly duties. To a third, he wanted to avoid the path of active service and lead a more or less aimless wandering life. He advised, do not lead an easygoing life anymore. If you do, you will not be able to practice spiritual exercises properly. Any work that you take up, do with your whole heart. This is the secret of work. And this is another thing that we need to remember, that the teachings that these great teachers give is, is customized to specific individuals. Because we, while we do share a lot of common characteristics, there are also things in which we di differ from one another. And therefore, the teachings that Ram Ramakrishna and his disciples gave were suited to the individual to whom it was given. And so sometimes it, and actually it can be sometimes confusing. Sometimes it might seem contradictory when we read accounts, say reminiscences of these great ones. We say, oh, all that, that day you said like this, and now you say like this. So there's contradiction. But then we might say, well, that day, who was this person speaking to? So that's important. And the, we see this also occurring in Vivekananda's um, life. Once he was speaking on the West Coast in San Francisco, and um, he made some comment. And then one of the, one among the audience, one woman gets up and says, Swami, what you say makes no sense to me. And then Swamiji said, Madam, it was not meant for you. <laughs> and then someone else gets up and says, but Swami, it makes complete sense to me. He said, ah, it was meant for you. <laughs> so again, what's important here is when we read the spiritual books, not everything necessarily has to make sense. Because these teachers were speaking to a wide spectrum of different spiritual seekers. And so if something doesn't resonate with your head and heart, doesn't um, feel relevant to you, you don't have to worry about it. Everything doesn't have to be relevant. What we do have to find is that portion or that section which we find is particularly relevant to us. If that makes sense, then we have to see how I can practice it, how it will help me become a better person. That is one thing. The second thing is that even if something is not relevant to me now, I don't know, maybe five years down the line or 10 years down the line, uh, it might become relevant. And we do see it happening that way. Sometimes you will see that um, something suddenly clicks in your mind. And then you say, oh, years ago, I had read somewhere. And, and now you feel, ah, how true it is. But maybe at the time you read it, it probably didn't make too much impression on you. So as we evolve, as we change, as we grow, what becomes relevant to us will also keep on changing. Things which are relevant at one stage may not become relevant at another stage. To a little child, the little toy is very relevant. It's, 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 it's very important. Uh, but, but as the child grows, you become a teenager, uh, you have different sets of toys. Uh, then uh, don't, if you're still hung up on the toys you had of three or four years old, then actually it's a matter of worry. Everyone is, <laughs> gets worried then. So our relevance, um, things which are relevant keep on changing, which is okay. So, so that's one other thing important to remember. Not when, only when reading Brahmananda, but even all Vedanta texts, there are so many ways of understanding reality. There are so many ways of relating to God. Now, although we might speak often about the Atman or the spirit, now, we have to recognize that it's not necessary that everyone's entry point into spiritual life has to occur through the Atman. Not necessary. Some 
people might enter spiritual life through a, a, a theistic, a devotional temperament, seeing God as, as one's own, seeing oneself as a child of God, a servant of God, which, is, which will lead to the same spiritual transformation as someone who might enter a spiritual life through a philosophical bent of mind, or someone who might enter spiritual life through focusing on, on selfless service, on helping the needy without seeking its fruit. So there are, just like you can enter Harvard Yard through, <laughs> through many of the, the doorways, and you uh, finally end up in the same place, exactly in the same way, spiritual life, you can really enter from, there are many entry points. And so we don't have to be fanatical about, about my own way being the only way. And that's the, the, the basic uh, principle we find in, in Vedanta and in the teachings of Ramakrishna and his disciples. With Brahmananda's deep insight into human nature, he always recognized the value and necessity of passing through the discipline of work which he wanted to be combined with spiritual practice. And so his general advice to the workers of the order was, work and worship must go hand in hand. As the Gita says, without performing work, none can reach worklessness. One can attain knowledge merely through the discipline of work. Instead of working for yourself, work for the sake of God. If you can work with this idea, your work will not bind you. On the other hand, it will improve you in every way. The mind gets good training if one takes up some regular work at the beginning of spiritual life. Then the trained mind can be applied to meditation and other spiritual practices. In Swami Brahmananda, one could see an extraordinarily balanced personality in whom the highest knowledge, deepest devotion, absolutely selfless spirit of service and intense concentration were wonderfully blended. He possessed great psychic powers, which he rarely used, except for the good of others. Those who knew him intimately marveled to witness his highly developed aesthetic taste, his remarkable love of music, his great interest in gardening, his loving care of animals, his keen knowledge of law, finance, and engineering, his extreme strictness to the management of public funds, his unique resourcefulness and practicality, his uncommon common sense, all of which were the different manifestations of his versatile genius. You can see with all this um, description how the title, the, his nickname Raja, really suited him perfectly. He was no scholar in the ordinary sense of the term, but he was endowed with a natural and unfailing intuition that brought him directly in touch with the very nature of things and revealed their secrets to a mind always open to truth wherever it may be found. And, and a small portion I want to read to you from, from this book, The Eternal Companion. Here is a set of question answers we find. This is on page 164. Uh, here is the question. Maharaj, the other day you told me that the mind can be made steady in two ways. Now, which of these two am I to follow? The answer. Hold the mind fast to the sacred feet of your chosen ideal. Chosen ideal is the, that aspect of the divine that we meditate on, on which we focus our mind and whose mantra we chant. Where shall I meditate upon the blessed form of my chosen ideal? And the answer is in the heart. How should I meditate? Consider your deity as facing you while you are in meditation. The question, but the heart is of flesh and blood. How can a man think of the Ishta there? Again, a kind of question that any of us might ask. His answer was, do not think of flesh, bones, and all that. Your chosen ideal is residing right in the core of the heart itself. Develop this idea and meditate. In the beginning, of course, the idea of flesh, bone, etc. might sometimes rise in your mind, but later it will not. You will forget it totally. Only the image of the chosen ideal will then reign supreme in your mind. Question, shall I think of my Ishta, a chosen ideal, exactly as I find him in pictures and images? 
Answer, yes. But think of him as living and luminous. Question. I've heard that along with Japa, one must meditate on the meaning of the mantra. Now, how to think of the meaning, letter by letter, or taking the mantra as a whole? Answer. Do you know what is a mantra like? It is just like addressing a band by his name. The moment I address you by your name, your form also flashes in my mind. Similar is the case with the mantra and the form of the chosen ideal that is associated with it. Question. How shall I perform japa, mentally or audibly? Answer. When you are alone in a solitary retreat, then do it in a manner as may be audible to you only. If there is somebody nearby, it must be done mentally. Question. When I do japa, I clearly perceive the mantra shining bright and effulgent before my eyes. I see only the mantra and not my chosen ideal. Answer. That is a very good and auspicious sign indeed. You must see both. The mantra is Brahman manifested as name. So see the mantra and also try to see the form of the Ishta. Question. While visualizing the form of the Ishta to, in meditation, shall I begin with his face? Answer. Begin from his lotus feet. Offer your salutations at his feet and then visualize his face, hands, etc. Question. Why is the mantra so very long? Answer. True. The mantra sometimes becomes long. But long or short, it possesses a special power. And if you, if you perform japa constantly, you will know the truth of it in a short time. Question. Many say it is harmful if the forefinger touches the rosary at the time of japa. Answer. Do you, perf do you perform japa with the forefinger? It is better not to do it at, in that way. But if you find it difficult otherwise, you may use the forefinger. It will not do any harm. Question. How shall I steady the mind? Answer. By daily practice of meditation. And for this practice early morning, and for this practice, early morning is the best time. Before meditation, reading from any of the holy scriptures will make concentration easier. After meditation, sit silently for about half an hour. For at the time of meditation, you may not experience its effect. It may come a little later. Therefore, it is said that if you immediately after meditation, you divert your attention abruptly to secular affairs, it will not only do you great harm in general, but it will also deter the growth of your mind towards spiritual realization in particular. Japa and meditation are the food of the mind, and their practice is most essential. Even if you don't relish it in the beginning, you must practice regularly. Even through your practice, you, can, you gain a good deal. Daily, at least two hours of japa and meditation is required. <laughs> Keep that as an ideal. But, but, but don't let this make you feel like, oh, two hours is not possible, so let me not do anything at all. So whatever you can do, uh, just make a beginning. And then gradually, as and when circumstances are more favorable and suitable, and you feel like doing it more, you can increase the time. But, but something is always better than nothing. Solitary retirement is also a great help to the spiritual seeker. Simply by sitting silently in the secluded nook of a garden, or in the solitary bank of a river, or on the lonely outskirt of a vast open field, or shut up within your own room, you can profit much. You must drop a routine before you start your spiritual practices, and you must not take upon yourself any work which may stand in the way of following this routine. So in this way, so this is just a small sampling of um, the kind of instruction. Again, um, these are very, very uh, practical questions to which the practical answers are given. But as I said, not every answer has necessarily to be relevant to you. Uh, again, because these were given to, to different uh, groups of students. Oftentimes, many of them were young monastics. So sometimes you might find um, him saying things like, well, you must meditate so many hours. 
which may not always be possible for everyone, at, depending on our nature of our work and responsibilities. Uh, but nonetheless, you will see that the questions and the answers here make spiritual life more tangible, more practical, brings it down from abstract principles to something that we can uh, practice in our daily life. So if you haven't uh, seen these books, I would strongly encourage you to take a look and uh, learn and benefit from these great teachings. Because ultimately, and this is very important, ultimately what would matter is not how many books we have read. Uh, what ultimately would matter is how much of what we have read uh, we have digested, and not just to enrich our intellectual understanding, but also to change our life to, to become a better human being. So reading too many books may not necessarily be a good idea. If all that I'm reading is, um, there, there is, a, there is a, um, a proverb in one of the Indian languages which says that um, the idea is this, that whatever I'm reading now is fresh in my mind, but the book that I read last week or 10 days ago, that's forgotten. And then when I pick up another book again, then this will be forgotten and that will be fresh in mind. So that really then doesn't help much other than just a psychological idea. Oh, I've read, I've read all that. I've read all this. So what if I've read all it? It really doesn't, doesn't make any difference. So this is something that as spiritual seekers we have to keep in mind. It's not about how many lectures you have attended. It's not about how many books you have read. It's not about how long you are associated with the Vedanta society or any place of worship. Um, all of that really doesn't matter. What would ultimately matter is how are you right now as a human being? Has whatever things that have made sense to you, things that you believe are right, good, and true, have I tried to live according to those principles? Has it influenced the way I think, the way I relate to other people, the way I do my work? That's, that's really what would matter. Because when we die, as one day we all will, all of these things will be left behind. We cannot take anything with us. The only thing that will go with us is a transformation that has occurred in our own heart. The rest, everything will be left here. And so we must get our priorities straight. And that is the message that comes to us again and again and again and again through Brahmananda's teachings. So as we pay a tribute and seek the grace of Swami Brahmananda from his life and teachings, May his teachings help us grow spiritually so that we may all reach the goal of our lives. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohur Mohu. We bow down to Ramakrishna and Holy Mother. Next Sunday, we will have Antar Yoga, as usual, with the music, spiritual readings, reflection, and the birthday celebration of everyone born in, in January. So especially those who are born in January, please come. And if you know anybody else who's born in January also, bring them along. <laughs> <laughs> On, on Wednesday, we will uh, continue with the study of the Gita uh, and our study group meetings. And on Tuesday and Saturday, our Aarti and meditation will also continue as usual. So let's conclude with a prayer. Um, in today's prayer, um, as many of you are aware, one of our very dear members, uh, Linda Clave, um, she has been in the intensive care unit for the last few days. Her, her condition is improving. Um, but she's still there in ICU, so when we pray, uh, please remember her in your prayers and uh, so that she may heal quickly and be with us soon. Let's begin. Oh. 
May the divine being, who is the Father in heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.